Hi everyone, thanks for being here in such a special week that I know that <laughs> not everyone really wanted necessarily to be at the university. Um, so Marcelo has pretty much introduced me uh, and today I wanted to kind of show uh, a little bit of what I've done uh, to you guys. Uh, I know that the Pantanal is not always here, uh, presented here in the trophy lunch, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about the Pantanal. And what I'm going to present to you is basically some of the research that I did uh, during my PhD and the, pretty much the, the topics that I have been interested in pursuing uh, since then. Um, so, and as Marcelo said, I do uh, this very research oriented, uh, like science oriented things at my postdoc, but I'm also uh, acting with the um, uh, Institute for Conservation of Wild Animals trying to integrate that scientific uh, thinking with actual uh, practical conservation actions. And today I'm going to talk about mammal conservation in the Pantanal wetlands of Brazil, uh, talk a little bit about movement patterns, armadillos, and climate change. Uh, so the Pantanal is located right in the middle of South America, uh, in the border between Brazil, Bolivia, and Paraguay. The Pantanal is one of the largest wetlands in the world, one of the largest alluvial fans uh, in the tropics. And the Pantanal was actually formed uh, during the uprise of the Andes. So you have this huge lowland area surrounded by these high plateaus that are covered by savanna. And what is interesting, interesting is that uh, most of the rivers that flow through the Pantanal actually have their springs here uh, in the plateaus. And the Pantanal is pretty much regulated by this flood regime and we have annual flood, uh, flood regimes and also multi-annual. So we have several uh, years with higher floods and several years uh, with more severe drought, droughts uh, besides the annual flows. And this um, flood regime pretty much shapes everything that happens in the Pantanal from its vegetation structure. So we have permanent ponds in the Pantanal, but we also have temporary ponds. And when they dry out, these areas are covered by open grassland. And the areas that do not flood that are a little bit in higher ground, and when I mean higher ground, it could be like 10 centimeters and that already makes a huge difference. And so in these areas, have more uh, dense vegetation and even like semi-decidual forests that are formed in these regions. And the flood regime also uh, pretty much shapes what can be done in the Pantanal, the types of activities that can be developed in the Pantanal. And what we see is that like it's, it's, it has such poor drainage and everything, such poor soil that agriculture is not really um, good in the Pantanal. So, the main activity is extensive uh, traditional cattle ranches, ranching made by the Pantaneros, uh, which are also influenced by this uh, flood cycle. So the cattle pretty much forages in, the, in those natural grasslands. Uh, however, in the past years, uh, there has been a change, a change in culture in the Pantanal, because, mainly because uh, like the traditional um, ranch owners are dying, and their families are inheriting the land and they are either splitting uh, like between brothers or someone that not necessarily grew up in the Pantanal. Many of those people like are from big cities and they just inherit these cattle ranches and they say I don't want to like go through all this trouble of like managing cattle in the floodland and like putting like three, three heads of cattle per hectare. I want to do way more. So they convert the land and plant like highly productive and exotic pasture. And so this is one of the biggest threats to the Pantanal right now, this extreme land conversion. And here you can see how they just like uh, chop the landscape. And so uh, we have been facing a lot of uh, like growing land degradation in the Pantanal. Here's the Pantanal limits. And in green you have uh, original vegetation and in red you have converted vegetation. And so you can see that the, the process is beginning in the Pantanal, but in the surrounding uh, savannas, the, there's, it's pretty bad. And that's mainly uh, related to 
soy bean plantations and intensive cattle ranching and small and medium uh, hydrolytic, hydrolytic dams. And that is super important to the Pantanal because all the rivers are flowing this direct, in this direction. So all the garbage that is that generated here flows into the Pantanal. However, nevertheless, the Pantanal is still a very pristine landscape that holds really large populations of species that are rare elsewhere. And so it is still uh, a place to see how animals uh, behave without actual uh, impact, or without a lot of impact. And what I, what I will focus today is actually on movement patterns. And I hope I have given um, uh, a background for you to understand how the Pantanal works. And I hope everything fits together by the end. Um, but movement is basic to like the life of every organism. And movement is just the displacement of an organism in space through any amount of time. And movement of organisms uh, is shaped, uh, is driven by processes that act across multiple spatial and temporal scales. And it pretty much has a huge role on the fate of individuals. Movement will define if an animal will reach a good spot or a bad spot for foraging. Movement will define uh, the likelihood of that animal encountering a predator or encountering a mating partner. And so movement has the potential to shape and structure uh, populations, communities, and ecosystems. <laughs> and given the proper amount of time, uh, it will pretty much shape how evolution and diversity of life. Um, animal behavior is shaped by movement in many forms. And actually, movement is a part of uh, many aspects of animal behavior. Activity, for example, you can see that as just the timing an animal decides to move. Uh, and animal behavior is actually shaped by many factors. Uh, it's shaped by extrinsic factors, and that could be uh, habitat fragmentation, changes in land use, uh, exotic invasion of exotic species, uh, changes in climate conditions, and interactions with both conspecifics and also uh, other species. Um, but animal behavior is also shaped by intrinsic factors, and those can be neurological and physiological stimuli. And the behavior that we actually see uh, in animals is composed of trade-offs between all of those factors that should ultimately uh, increase individual fitness. Uh, and today I want to focus in one specific uh, extrinsic factor that has the potential to shape animal behavior, that is temperature. And that's especially important when you consider that climate change might become one of the biggest threats to biodiversity in a few decades. And to study that, uh, we need species that have a real potential to actually respond. Uh, to temperature variation. And they, like Xenotra, are these little guys, uh, very nice looking little guys. <laughs> uh, this is a super order composed of sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. Uh, Xenotra is actually a basal clade of placental mammals. Uh, and they have some very interesting characteristics. For example, they have really low basal metabolic rate. And so it's something like 30 to 50% of what you would expect from another mammal or other placental mammals with the same uh, body size. Um, and they also are considered basal endoterms. That is, uh, they are able to produce body heat like other placental mammals. However, they are really bad at managing that heat. Uh, and so that makes them pretty good models to uh, evaluate uh, the effects of temperature on behavior. Uh, armadillos, in specific, uh, have one more characteristic, that, that is they, they possess this carapace. That's, uh, the carapace is a structure made of osteoderms, uh, that is a bony uh, tissue covered with skin, 
uh, similar to what uh, crocodiles have in their back. And the carapace actually increases armadillo's uh, thermal conductance. That is, they lose and gain heat really fast, like way faster than another a mammal with the same size would, especially if the mammal had like a layer of fur that would insulate its body. And that has consequences. Um, that means that armadillos usually have very, uh, a very small range of temperatures where they feel comfortable and they do not require energy to thermal regulate. Uh, and so that means that even in the tropics, armadillos will frequently face uh, temperatures that are out outside of that comfort, comfort, uh, comfort zone. <laughs> I'm talking fast, right? <laughs> okay. And one more, one more thing, besides the carapace, they, Armadillos also dig burrows. They dig and use burrows. And burrows are used for resting and for escaping predators. But um, they're also used as thermal shelters. Uh, burrows, uh, here we have a, a graph that the solid line is burrow temperature and the dashed line is air temperature outside the burrow. So you can see that although there's a high variation along the day, of air temperature, sometimes like 20 degrees of variation, burrow temperatures tend to stay, to stay pretty much constant. And that, ma that makes them amazing thermal shelters. So armadillos are pretty easy to read in a sense that whenever conditions are good, they're outside their burrows. Whenever conditions are bad, they are inside their burrows. And so they are basal endotherms with a carapace with high thermal conduct uh, conduction and they are semi-fossorial. That means that they will present this super conspicuous responses uh, whenever environmental uh, conditions change. And that makes them amazing models for understanding how physiology uh, affects mammal behavior in response to environmental change. Um, and what I'm gonna present to you is actually uh, one of the products of my PhD that was published last year in Animal Behavior. And what we wanted to understand is uh, if and how uh, air temperature shapes uh, habitat selection and activity patterns of uh, tropical, and here we call it imperfect omnioterms, but that's the same as the basal endoterms. Uh, basal, yeah. <laughs> and for that, uh, we use two species. This little guy, the yellow armadillo, which is about four kilos, and this little guy, which is the three-banded armadillo, uh, that is way smaller, it's a kilo only, you can hold it in one hand, and it's the only one that can actually turn into a ball. In Brazil, they're called ball armadillos. <laughs> and, and we study three areas in the Pantanal. Uh, one area that is very pristine with that exten extensive uh, cattle ranching uh, activity, like very traditional. Another area that is uh, in the Amola mountain ridge <coughs> that is very pristine. However, they have established like a chunk of exotic pasture for uh, ranching. And the third area in the northern Pantanal that has pretty much all been converted into pasture or sugar, plant or sugar cane and has super small uh, native vegetation patches remaining. And wow, like in my papers, I go there and I write, and then we perform active searches and active captures of armadillos. But I feel that that's like, that's only for reviews. I need to share with you what it really means to work in, with armadillos in the wild, uh, because I don't know if many people know. So we basically, we go around the ranches and we walk for days until we actually find an armadillo so we can, some ranches we can do it by car, so uh, someone will drive and two other people will just stay in the back of the truck. Uh, in some places we had to use horses, which is pretty challenging for someone that has never ridden a horse before. And at the end I was able to actually take a picture <laughs> like mounting a horse, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> and well, and basically we would just like walk and I say like, sometimes for days without seeing an armadillo. But then at some point we actually get to see an armadillo and then you think, great, job done. 
But no, <laughs> uh, when you see an armadillo, you actually have to run after it and jump over it uh, to catch it. And that's like active search and manual capture. And, <laughs> and so here is uh, me and uh, uh, Ariel, and here is an armadillo between us. Um, it's like the first time that Ernesto saw this, he said, oh, this is such like a romantic afternoon <laughs> setting. <laughs> well, not at all. <laughs> and so, and that's pretty amazing. And many people uh, like come to me and say, oh my God, that must be really exciting. I wish I could see like that really happening. Well, you can. Um, so here's uh, one of the bats that works with me. He has a GoPro and he would just run after the armadillo. And like he just, he just jumped out of the car and when he approaches the armadillo, he jumps. And, can, and these are really prickly bushes, okay? These are not like simple bushes. And then you just like have to handle the armadillo. And this is a yellow armadillo, poor guy. And Ariel was addicted to capturing armadillos. Like he had a high chasing armadillos. And like that's how far the car was when, when we were running. So it's pretty cool, like you actually get addicted to the, to the thing. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show you how difficult it is. And this is like a successful capture because many times it just run and ends in the sand and that's it. Uh, um, and, but after that, like you'll say, okay, great, I captured my armadillos. I want to see move, a steady movement. I'll just put a radiant collar on them and that will be it. Wait, armadillos don't have necks. And so you have to figure out another way to do long-term monitoring of armadillos. And what we did was we uh, actually like mounted our little lab in the field. And this is like uh, surgery going on here. There's an armadillo in the table. And we used intra-abdominal uh, VHF transmitters. And so here's a three-banded armadillo with a transmitter uh, inside its belly. And, but that's... Like, that's good because we get to uh, follow the same individual for a long time. However, it's really hard to find uh, these animals with the VHF intra-abdominal because the reach of the signal is very uh, short. And so we also use GPS devices that we would attach externally to the armadillos, to the yellow armadillo we would put uh, in the tail, and with the three banded we would put in the back of the carapace. Um, to do this intensive monitoring, but this would fall like sometimes three days after we attach them. If we were lucky, it would last a month. Uh, but the thing is that uh, this provided us data like for every five minutes. So we had a location for the individual every five minutes, which is like crazy good uh, resolution for movement data. And the cool thing is also that we use like this uh, GPS devices that are super expensive, like a thousand, like and more uh, dollars. And well, it's research in Brazil. Uh, we don't really have like a PhD uh, dissertation, so we didn't really have a lot of money. And so what we did, we bought these GPSs that are actually used uh, by people to uh, go running and follow where they have been running. They cost like $30. And we would open them up and change batteries and change circuits and everything and shape our <laughs> own uh, GPS devices. And that has been used in the lab like for the past, I don't know, eight years or more uh, with like for deers and like uh, boars and everything. So that's very cool. And this costs maybe five times less or seven times less at the end. So that was pretty cool. And wow. <laughs> After running and jumping and everything, we were able to capture 17 yellow armadillos and get 14,000 locations for these individuals and 21 um, three-banded armadillos, reaching 61,000 locations for the three-banded armadillos. These are like the biggest uh, data sets you can get for movement of, the, of these species anywhere. And after all of that and all of that running, you finally get this. And this is like, this makes you smile because that's like, okay, I'm actually gonna have a PhD. <laughs> it's like, and so you can see the animals moving and where the guys went and why, like, and you see that some of them were moving way further from, from where you thought. 
and so that's why you weren't finding them and you get to see like they're, they're interacting and how they go back to the burrow and rest and that they select, they're selecting mainly these open areas. And so you start to see what is actually going on with all of those guys that you are chasing around. And that's pretty cool. <sighs> and then what you do with that, with all of that data. So what we wanted to do was evaluate if temperature was affecting or in any, in any sense activity patterns. And so we evaluated the effect of mean daily temperature on daily duration of activity, but also on uh, when the activities, when the armadillos decided to leave their burrows and also how much they would uh, walk once they were out of their, their burrows. Because these are all indicators of how comfortable the animal is uh, under that temperature. And we also evaluated habitat selection of these animals. We wanted to see uh, if they were selecting habitat based on only on cover type, on vegetation cover type, but also on the, the temperature they were experiencing every hour. And if there was an interaction between the, the temperature that they were experiencing and the time of the day, because experiencing something through a, a temperature during the day and during the night can be really different because of sun exposure, of course. And so what we did, we use that selection functions, and that is like we know where the animals uh, have moved and have used, but we want to see if they were selecting that or, or if uh, given their uh, motion capacity, they could have been uh, in other places that they acti actively avoided or if they actively selected that. And what we saw was that uh, temperature was actually shaping uh, activity patterns a lot. Like, for example, uh, for the yellow armadillo, uh, here we have uh, the distance moved and, and the time of the day. And so we would see that if it was cold, the animals uh, would, have, would walk a lot during the day. But as it got hotter, the animals would start walking more at night and they could actually sh uh, shift from a totally diurnal activity to a totally nocturnal activity. And that's a pretty big uh, shift for any animal. And we saw that uh, the tree-banded armadillo was also responding to temperature. When it was cold, it was uh, walking uh, around the sunset time, but as it got hotter, um, they started walking more uh, in the middle of the night. And we saw that uh, temperature was also shaping um, habitat uh, selection uh, patterns. And we saw that, for example, for forested areas, they would select forested areas whenever they were experiencing high temperatures uh, during the day or low temperatures during the night. And that means that they are pretty much seeking shelter inside forested areas whenever they are experiencing extreme temperatures. And grassland uh, use also changed according to time of the day and temperature. And the tree banded armadillos, if it was hot, it would be walking on grassland at night. But if it was cold, it would be resting on grasslands during the day to be exposed to that little uh, sun uh, in, um, on a cold day, like we do. <laughs> and so uh, we saw that like the, the sixth banded armadillo is shaping a lot of its uh, activity behavior while the three banded armadillo is shaping a lot of its uh, habitat selection behavior in response to temperature. And well, these are two species that are both basal endotherm, small mammals with high conductance, but they are, be they are behaving uh, differently in response to temperature changes. And so we see here it's my amazing scheme don't be uh jealous uh so the the yellow line is the yellow armadillo and the blue line is a three banded armadillo and what we see is that as air temperature increases uh the yellow armadillo <coughs> shifts from a diurnal behavior to a nocturnal behavior like uh increasing overlap in that uh temporal niche dimension <coughs> and Regarding habitat selection, as temperature increases, the tree-banded the tree armadillo that 
would normally use more forested and closed habitats will shift its activity to uh, open habitats, also increasing uh, overlap in the in the spatial niche uh, dimension. And that sets up a scenario for potential increase, for example, in, in interview competition. And if we think about it, uh, if every species, if all species are will respond slightly differently to the same stimuli that will be temperature change uh, in a climate in a climate change scenario, uh, we could expect uh, potential uh, alterations in all sorts of interspecific interactions, such as threat or prey dynamics, for example, which could potentially cause cascading effects and even affect uh, community dynamics in a climate change scenario. We also saw that uh, whenever animals were experiencing uh, extreme temperatures, they would select forested areas, uh, showing that the forested areas are actually acting as thermal refugia. And so here we have a uh, normal aerial image, uh, and here we have a thermal map of the same area. And what we see is that the forested areas are always cooler than all the other environments. Then uh, they're cooler than the, the um, agricultural landscapes and also urban landscapes. And so uh, in our study area, uh, forested, forested, forested areas were always, uh, had always like milder temperatures. So if it was super hot in a grassland area, forested areas could be up to eight degrees cooler. And if it was very cold uh, in grassland areas, um, forested areas could be up to five degrees warmer. So that's a big effect. And this is like a savanna vegetation. So it's not even the, the most close uh, vegetation. And here we have uh, a, a picture from the Pantanal also with a normal picture. And, uh, and the thermal imagery showing that the trees are always cooler. And so we see that animals are really using these forested, uh, forested areas whenever they can. And that shows the importance of uh, this natural landscape heterogeneity that we have in the Pantanal. Because whenever the animals can, they are shifting from open to closed areas depending on their uh, thermal needs, uh, their physiological needs. And so that uh, landscape heterogeneity is, is interesting and especially it should be maintained, especially at movement scale, because it doesn't matter if you have forested areas here and grassland areas there, and you, you have a, an armadillo that has a home range of this size, because he'll never be able to switch back and forth. <clears throat> and that's especially worrying uh, when you think that conversion of native vegetation is the main threat. Um, to the Pantanal nowadays. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, we had a decrease, uh, decrease of 43% in woodland vegetation in the Pantanal. Uh, and if this rate continues, there is, it is estimated that it could be all converted by 2045, which is like tomorrow. <laughs> and, and yeah, so we see that uh, habitat conversion and fragmentation has the potential to create instant changes in the thermal landscape in how the animals uh, perceive uh, the, the landscape thermally. And we also know that climate change has the potential to uh, change the, the thermal landscape gradually. And it will depend on how these two factors will interact to know uh, if climate change, climate change effects will be attenuated or ameliorated, that is, if you, if you experience climate change in an area uh, with a lot of vegetation cover, uh, the effects of climate change could be ameliorated, while if you are under the same climate change effect in a totally degraded area without this thermal refugia, um, this, this might just exacerbate the effects of climate change on the species and ecosystems under these effects. And basically, the impact of climate change will depend on a species' thermal sensitivity and like how 
the, how wide is the range of temperatures that it can uh, feel comfortable in, and also uh, the combination of behavior thermal regulation strategies that the species can adopt. And the most common uh, strategies uh, that we know of for mammals, for uh, reptiles, amphibians, is both habitat selection and activity pattern, choosing where you are and when you are at certain habitats. However, uh, we know that there is a severe uh, tendency of decrease of forest cover, and that means decrease of uh, potential thermal refugia. And so some animals and populations might be left without the option of uh, habitat selection as a thermal regulation strategy. And that means that they will have to rely only on their timing of activity, which could lead to an increase of hours of restriction. That is the amount of hours that the animals will have to take shelter uh, to avoid this unfavorable environmental condition and will not be performing uh, fitness related activities such as um, foraging or finding mates. And that has known to cause population declines already in lizards uh, by various interval. And Ta-da! We actually saw that also in a previous study for the yellow armadillo. And so we saw a decrease of hours of activity as temperature increased. And so they also have the potential to suffer from this increase of hours of restriction, even being tropical mammals adapted to uh, warm areas. And so what we saw was that uh, Sinatras are pretty amazing indicator species to anticipate the effect of habitat conversion and climate change for uh, tropical endotherms. And we also saw the importance of temperature modulating both the daily activity patterns and also habitat selection. And we could illustrate how temperature constraints vary dynamically along the day and among days, because we know that uh, climate change and temperature changes are changing uh, uh, the timing when species do do their activities like over a year, for example. But this fine scale effect has not been really explored yet, besides our <laughs> study. Um, and we also saw that activity patterns and habitat selection are actually very dynamic. And we want to fit animals into these little boxes and say, my species occupied forests forest and, and is active during the day. But actually, these patterns can be way more plastic, way more dynamic. And when we are thinking about uh, conservation, we should think about that. And because we are trying now to uh, do conservation planning in a changing world. And we cannot assume that animals will just stay there in their boxes. We have to account for these potential behavioral changes when we are thinking about long-term or mid-term uh, conservation planning. And that's it. Thank, I want to thank you guys for being here and thank ev everyone that helped me in the field at some point, the vets and the, and the undergrads and the friends. And also uh, thank the partners that uh, uh, did the study with me, the funders uh, that funded us during my PhD, people that gave us like te technical support during the field and uh, financers of this test project. Thank you.